Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Cortex, um, the multi-tenant scalable Prometheus. Um, but before we get started, uh, we'd like to quickly introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Charlie. I am a Cortex maintainer. Um, and my motto is to stay hungry, stay foolish. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Daniel. I'm also a Cortex maintainer. And as motto, I chose it, be curious. All right, so uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, stuff that we want to talk about today. So on the agenda, we're going to first introduce uh, what Cortex is, um, and then uh, talk about what's new and what's next. And then finally, uh, Daniel's going to be talking about the partition compactor, which is like a, a pretty cool concept that's coming uh, very soon. And then finally, we'll have a Q&A. So, Keep your questions um, in mind. Uh, at the end, you can ask us. So first, um, I'd like to first start by talking about Prometheus, which is um, pretty stable technology. I think um, it's a graduated project in the CNCF. And uh, I think most folks are comfortable with um, what it is nowadays. Um, so essentially, you have three components. The first is the collection or the collector piece, which is how metrics come into Prometheus. So you can either have remote write, so um, things can write to Prometheus, or Prometheus can scrape the services that it is monitoring for metrics. And that's kind of how metrics usually get in, gets into Prometheus. Um, and then once they're in, they're stored in the time series database. Um, and you know, it's it's um, it, it's a time series database, and you can you can use PromQL to query it. Um, there's a lot of um, performance um, improvements and uh, optimizations that are happening within the time series database itself, and it's actually what um, is used in Cortex. But I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and then on the right side, the third component is the query part. So you have all these metrics that are in this time series database, but you know you, you need to fetch it out. So there's this query part. So the query engine in Prometheus is what's used to query those metrics. Um, but as you start to grow and grow, you're going to have more and more metrics come in. And how do you scalably manage all of that? Um, in Prometheus, you would normally just scale your Prometheus instance to have more memory, have more CPU, have more disk. Um, but there's a limit to how much Prometheus can manage, because it's really just built for a single node instance. Um, you can make the, the Prometheus instance larger, but you know, there's a limit. So what can you do? In Cortex, the idea is, how do you split those components up into different pieces so that you can scale them individually? Um, the idea here is. If you wanted to have more writes, you can scale up for more writes. If you want to have more reads, scale up for more reads. If you want to be able to manage more metrics, scale up the middle piece. Um, so that's what these components are. The distributor handles the writes. The ingester handles the storage of the, the, the metrics and memory. Um, and then the queriers handles all of the reads from uh, you know, all of your different dashboards or different clients that are trying to fetch metrics. Um, so an example is if you want to have uh, more ingesters. Add another ingester. The distributor will know uh, where to store those metrics. Um, and then the querier will know where to read the metrics. Um, I'm kind of glance, or, uh, uh, going through the, the, the complexity of where or which ingester should a distributor use to um, like pick for a specific metric, um, and which ingester should a query your pick for fetching that metric. I'm kind of glossing over those details right now just to keep it simple. Um, but the idea is you don't really have to worry about all of that. Cortex does it for you. So for example, in the Prometheus instance, right, you scaled up this Prometheus to be super large, but then it's not able to manage your metrics anymore. So the only thing you could do is maybe you want to scale up another Prometheus and then have that, uh, have that Prometheus just manage those metrics. Um, then you don't want to get into the business of like figuring out, oh, I'm going to use this Prometheus for managing 
um, these sets of metrics and then scale up this Prometheus to manage this set of metrics, right? You'll have all of these different sets of Prometheuses and you're not really sure, okay, should I use this one or that one, right? It's not really obvious, but in Cortex, it's not a detail, right? You just say, I want more ingesters. Boom, you're done. Add more ingesters. You want to have more distributors. Add more distributors and you're done. So that's kind of the nice, nice thing about Cortex here. Um, on the query side, you want to have more queriers, add another querier. And guess what? For the distributors, you want to add more distributors, add another distributor. So um, I've talked about um, handling metrics sort of on the um, uh, short term scale, but like what happens when you want to have metrics for long term? You can't store all of your metrics on disk. You're going to run out of disk eventually. You can't store all of it in memory. You're going to run out of memory eventually. So obviously, you need to store it somewhere. So there's usually an object storage solution that you can use. Um, and that basically gives you infinite storage. So just have your metrics that you want to query long term in the object storage, and then fetch it when you want to um, use it. So that process uh, happens with the store gateway. The store gateway is full, only, its only responsibility is to get metrics that are in your object storage and then return it to you. So the querier, like I mentioned before, is what is used on that read path. And when you want to read metrics that are short term, like you know, uh, a day or a couple of hours, you would go to the ingester. And then if you want to get metrics that are in long-term storage, you would go to the store gateway. And then the store gateway would figure out, OK, this is uh, the object storage to use. I'm going to fetch the series in there and then return it to you, uh, to the querier. And then the querier returns it back to you know, whatever visualization tool that you have. The last piece that I wanted to talk about um, was the compactor, um, the, the last component, that is. Um, and this is important because you have all of these ingesters that are uploading these blocks to object storage. But um, eventually, you're going to have all these blocks, and they're going to have kind of like the same sets of series in all of them. And when you do the query for all of these blocks, it's not going to be efficient because it has to dedupe all of these metrics when it's serving it to the, query, um, to the client. Um, so the compactor does that for you, and it does it periodically. Um, so it compacts these blocks together and then creates a new block with all of those metrics in there that's all deduplicated and um, will basically reduce the storage use as well because you don't need to have all of these blocks. Um, uh, the last thing uh, uh, that I wanted to mention was the member list part of, uh, of Cortex. Um, you have all of these components here. They're on different nodes, but how do they figure out like what's going on in the cluster. Um, so let's focus on one piece of it, the ingester piece. So um, let's say the ingester says, uh, I have these tokens, uh, 1 through 512. Um, and the importance of these tokens is that this is how um, the uh, system knows where certain metrics should go. So each ingester will have a certain set of tokens. They're randomly generated. Um, and then there's this distributor piece, which I'm not including in this slide right now, but there's the distributor piece that um, shards that metric. And if that token is in a certain range, it'll pick this ingester to use for uh, storing that metric. But um, the idea is that how do all of these ingesters know which, um, or which tokens they have? And the way it does this is through a gossip ring protocol, um, member list. So uh, ingester on node one will say, I have these tokens, uh, 1 through 512. It will talk to the other ingesters and say, I have these tokens. And then that ingester will propagate that, um, that information to the other ingesters. And then eventually, all of the ingesters will have the same set of information. Um, and it does this by just gossiping, right? There's no external dependency that you need for storing this, uh, this information. 
Um, the other cool thing is what happens if that node vanishes, right? Like it disappears, it's unresponsive, it's no longer healthy. What happens then? How does this gossip ring help with figuring out what's going on? Well, there's this thing called the heartbeat um, interval. And so it's each ingester's responsibility to update this, um, this state of when it last heartbeated. And all of these ingesters will get a copy of that state using the same gossip ring protocol. Um, and so if it doesn't update that state within a certain amount of time, it's considered unhealthy by all the other, uh, um, by all the other ingesters. So what happens is now they all know if that ingester wasn't updating, updating its um, heartbeat quick enough, then the ingesters will say, okay, this ingester is no longer healthy. Don't use it for um, any of the operations that require like storing or reading uh, metrics. Um, that is what I wanted to talk about for the introduction to Cortex. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Daniel to talk about what's new. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what's new, uh, what, what we are doing, and uh, deep, deep, uh, deep dive in the partition compactor. So the last talk that we had was around March 2024. 20, uh, since then, like, we had two new releases, the dot .17 and dot .18. Uh, we also had 22 new contributors to the project, uh, two new maintainers, which are actually us, and 30, 325 PR merges. I think this shows that the project is growing, it's healthy, and the community is helping a lot us, which is very nice. Talk a little bit more about the uh, release that we had it. Uh, the, the, the 17, uh, just some highlights. Uh, we did have OTLP ingestion. We did have also token spread out strategy, which basically helps balancing these metrics on ingestures and having a better limit. Uh, we also are working a lot on query optimization. So we do have a story here for query scattering, query priority, which can give you priority for some queries that are more sensitive for you, for alerts, for some dashboards. Uh, and we're also working a lot in the rules HA, uh, high availability for our rulers. So in the 17, we launched the list rules API HA, which avoids impact when you have a rulers restarting or updating, all this kind of stuff. For the 18, we kind of continue with the same stories. Uh, we do have another story for the rules HA, which are adding filtering for alerts. It was a pinpoint for the users of Cortex. Uh, sometimes when you have a lot of rules, it makes it harder to read them. You don't have pagination. Uh, the query rejection and the ingestion metadata API limits are also related to the query improvements. Uh, the query rejections is basically rejecting bad users. The API limits is protecting just a little bit more to not impact the right path. And the native histogram is a big, uh, big milestone for us. Uh, we actually demoed this in last, last Kubicon, and we finally launched it in the 18 version. In progress is also related to what we already been doing. So we have the rules HA work, which is for the whole service. We have remote write 2.0. Uh, we have moot caching, moot level chunk cache, actually. We already have some cache in the index. We are working caching for ingestors. And these are all for helping the uh, query story that we are working on. And another stuff that we, another feature that we worked on, and is actually talking about this for like one year, I guess, is partition compactor. And I really want to dive deep on how Partition Compact was made and how it works uh, for you guys to understand it. So before talking about Partition and Compactor, I want to briefly mention how Compactor itself works. Uh, so as Charlie already mentioned, Compactor basically gets blocks and put it together to improve how query works, to uh, decrease the amount of duplicated data. So in this scenario here, for example, we have three ingestures, they have the blocks, they are created from the head compaction, the, the, the information that they receive it. Uh, they are put in the long-term storage. I kind of briefly show here how this information is on the long-term storage because it's gonna help us understanding more about the compactor partitioning. So each block has an index and a meta file. The index is basically the symbol that you have, all the lab label names, this kind of stuff. And the meta file is the metadata for that block. So looking more on how compactors use that, so they can list these for getting, getting the, the blocks, but how they actually compact them. So if you take a look of the compactor itself, it can be separated in three stages, which are basically the grouper, the planner, and the compaction, which is actually merging the data. On the grouper part, 
what is basically looking into the meta files that we mentioned before. So in the, in the meta files, we have a mean time and a max time, and that's how we aggregate data. It's by the time range that the, each file it is. It's on. Uh, and after deciding which group of blocks they are going to be compacted, we actually go to the planner phase. And in this planner phase, it's important to avoid do two compactors or more working the same block. So here we want to avoid um, double compaction or a double data on the, on the storage side. So what we do here is we add a visit marker on the block side, on the block side of things, to mention that the compactor X, Y, and Z is working on the compaction for that block, and other compactors cannot work on that simultaneously. This is going to be helpful for understanding partition compactor later. After all of these, we actually do the compaction itself. Uh, in a normal compaction, we just have one block outcoming. So we have block four, for example, with the index meta. And we can see here that the meta is a little bit different. We have a level, which is increasing because we, did, we just did a compaction. And we have a source, which is a list of blocks that are related to this information. So why are we doing partition compactor? So we basically have two problems with partition, with the compaction nowadays. One of those is the index size. So TSDB just allows us to have a max index size of 64 gigabytes. So for example, if you have the three blocks that I mentioned before, and each one has an index size around 30 gigabytes, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have a sum of it as a new block, because it depends on the duplication of data, the labels, the, the, the name of the, same, the, the, the labels that you have. But if it's greater than 64 gigabytes, for example, here it's 70 gigabytes, it's going to fail. So this compaction is going to fail forever. There's nothing we can do. What we did so far to mitigate that is adding a no compaction marker, which we can actually put in the folders structure of that block. And when a grouper comes in, we just skip that block. But there's nothing you can do about that, and it's going to be forever there. Another issue that we noticed uh, previously is also about is lower compaction. So this can, happen, this can happen mostly because of two problems. One of them is like if you have a very long list of blocks on your uh, storage, it can be very slow to list them and to get information of what you need to group. And that can be delaying the compaction. And the other one, which is more common, is kind of the previous scenario where you have like an index which is 30 gigabytes. If you try to download a bunch of 30 gigabytes index and you try to upload after the results, which is going to be, I don't know, 60 or something like that, it's going to take a very long time. And that can cause a lot of delay in your compaction. And you can realize that your compaction is actually uh, slowing down instead of speeding up. So that's basically why we decided to do the partition compactor. And that's why it impacted us so much. I'm going to try to explain a little bit here what information we added on the files that already existed. And after, try to merge the, all this together and show how the partition compactor works. So in the metadata file of a block, we actually added this part, which is called partition information. So we have a partition group ID, which is a number, but it's actually generated by the min and max time of the blocks. So it's kind of the range of the partition group. We have a partition count, which is actually decided, and we're going to see later how we decide that, with the number of partitions for that partition group. And we have a partition ID, which is basically the partition for that exactly block that we are looking right now. We also need to change how the grouper and planet work it of the compactor. Uh, that's the biggest change that we had it in the compactor. So the grouper right now, uh, before, was just using the min and max time range. And now we have to use this partition information that we just created. So that's the new way of the compactor to merge blocks. It's, it gets the min and max time range still, but it also looks at partition information to see which blocks can go together. So here, for example, we have a partition count as two. And then we have partition ID 0 and 1. And you can see that there are different blocks in some of these partition groups, in the partition IDs. The planner changed a little bit also just because of the visit marker. To make this work, we cannot have the old visit marker that we had because it's blocking the whole block. And what we want to do now is having multiple compactions in the same block because they can go for different partitions. Uh, so we change it, that visit marker and remove it from the block, and we put in a new structure for the, for the partition group itself. So it's also good because we can know what's, which partition groups are being worked and which partition ID is actually being compacted. It's very easy now to get information about like, how much partitions, how much compaction we still have in the queue. So how this looks like when you put everything together. So 
One thing that we added for making this work is the new configuration, which basically tells us what's the size of a partition that you want. So for example, here in this scenario, we have a 30 million uh, partition. And the block already has uh, some meta information mentioning how much time series you have in a block. So for example, in this scenario here, which we have three blocks, and they all together have a million time series. When you put in the, in the configuration the 30 million time series, we're going to have four partition count. And that's what the compact is going to create. So you can see here that before we had just one block out coming from the compaction, and now we have four blocks, four, five, six, and seven, and each one of those has their own index and their own meta file. We can also notice the difference that we mentioned about the partition group information that's in all meta files for that file that box. But the, the crux of the problem in partition compactor is how do you know where to put a block or how the blocks go together? So, I'm going to give some scenarios here in the tree. One thing to understand very well is the partition count of a, of a partition group can, can need to be a, a, of power of two. That allows us to know where a block came from and when a block needs to go. So for example here, if we have a partition count as four and one block is from partition ID zero, if you want to decrease the number of partitions, let's say that you are recompacting that block for, with new time range. If you want to decrease the number of partitions, uh, you know that this information comes from the partition count z to partition in the ID zero. And if you want to increase the number of partitions, you know that you need to put this block on the partition ID zero and partition ID four if you have a partition count eight. So that allows us to actually create the partition plans with, for the grouper and not lose data or merge data that are, are du duplicated in different blocks. So I'm going to just give an example how this works decreasing partition count. So for example, in this case here, the number of time series uh, in, a, in a metadata of the block can be lower or higher after the, the, the compaction because that's just a simulation. Uh, uh, it can be the duplication data on the blocks. So let's say that we did that first partitioning, that compaction, we had four partition counts. And now that we are doing the second level, an, an, a new level compaction, we actually want to decrease that because we noticed that a much, a, a much of a lot of that information was duplicated. And now we want to go to a partition count as two. So what happened with the boxes? So when we create a new partition group for the compaction, the partition count four and partition ID zero, if we put in the tree that I mentioned before, it needs to go to the partition ID zero of partition count two. So that's how we know how to group the blocks together. That's the same for the partition count ID one and partition count four. When you put it in the, in the tree that I mentioned before, it needs to go to the partition ID group two. And that also works for the increasing. So let's say that you are trying to compact much more blocks together because of the time range that you're compacting. Let's say that you're compacting 24 hours. So you want now to have eight partition counts, so you want to put these blocks in different types of partition IDs, and just using that tree, you can know where it came from. it needs to go. So basically, that's how partition compactor was made, with the partition information, the meta file, with that idea of always having a power of two for the partition count, and the changes in the, uh, in the grouper and in the visit marker. One thing that was nice about the change that we made it was while we are doing this change, one of the complaints about the, the community and the users is it's very hard to debug what's happening in Cortex. We cannot see what's being compacted. We cannot see how much we still have left to compact. So we try to add more metrics and more visibility on what's going on on the compactor side. So for example, here we can see the first uh, two metrics there are kind of a snapshot of your uh, long, storm, long storage data. So it tells you how much blocks you have active. It tells you how much blocks you have delete marked for deletion. Uh, below that, we have the information about the partition compactor itself, which is new. It basically, as we have a new visitor marker now, each visitor marker has a status, which can be pending, uh, in progress, or completed. So we can have metrics for how many remaining compactions you still have to make, how many in progress compaction you are doing right now. So we can compare that number with the number of pods that you have to see if it matches. Uh, we also added some information about the partitions itself, which says basically how much partitions you are in average creating for 
a time frame. So, for example, like in the two hours blocks, you are basically normally creating four partitions. That's what you need from the time series that you have. And the last one there is pretty cool because it kind of tells you how much delay you have in your partition. So this is this oldest plan offset is basically you are compacting a plan that was created 30 minutes ago. So if you're compacting a plan that was created two hours ago, something's wrong with compaction because it shouldn't be like that. Just some more examples of uh, uh, metrics that we added. We also added when the compaction runs, uh, we also added information on how much compaction was completed, how much compaction was started, the time of the compaction, so you actually kind of can know now how much time we are using for compacting in each of the time range, two, 12, four, eight, depends on what you configure. Uh, and that's basically the change that we did for partition compactor. So just overall, what we talked here today, the context reduction, the what's new with the two versions, the what's next with the partition compactor, the remote write, the deep dive of the partition compactor. Uh, and now we have some time for QA, Q&A. Thank you. You can uh, come to the mic here for questions, um, or we can just keep talking about whatever, whatever you guys want. <laughs> we didn't talk about multi-tenancy. We do that. Not much. Yeah. Okay. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you can go briefly into some of the best practices for multi-tenancy with regards to the ruler and the alert manager. Yeah. Can do that? So. Anything, sorry, anything specific about how to use Ruler Edit Manager? Like how to uh, best deploy, like should you use it in like the uh, Prometheus stack or should you play multiple Cortex rulers? Like how do you give tenants control over their own alerting and rules, have like centralized rules, like those kind of things that you've seen work? You wanna go? Oh uh, yeah, go. sure. Um, so with the, the rulers, you're talking about like, should I use Prometheus for doing alert manager uh, or recording rules, or should I use Cortex? Um, yeah, so um, with uh, Cortex, you do have that ruler component for handling like the recording rules. Um, you can basically uh, set that up for multi-tenancy as well, so that each tenant can you know, have their own recording rules. With Prometheus, you, you, I'm not really sure how you would be able to do the multi-tenancy bit in Prometheus. Um, so just having the ruler alone with multi-tenancy is a huge benefit. Um, and then the more recording rules that you have, like um, the more queries it's going to have on the, the ingesters or the store gateways, depending on like, the, the, the time range of those queries. Um, if you are running into issues with like, oh, it's um, uh, these recording rules are are too expensive to run, and it's like slowing down the, the queries. You can you can have limits on the the rulers themselves, or on a tenant level. So you can say don't allow more than this amount of recording rules um, per tenant, right? And that can help with some of the the issues with um, too many uh, recording rules. Um, there's um, I think uh, also if you are if you are deploying with Kubernetes, uh, we also are kind of suggesting to use stateful sets right now because we are doing rule HA, and with that, you can easier restarting or maintain the pods. We are also adding the tokens that we talked about, the ingestures, we also added that to the ruler itself to also maintain the same users for rulers, which helps a lot for the availability issue that we are having. Sometimes, right nowadays, when you are starting a ruler, like you can have one user missing some uh, 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 metrics, uh, rulers running, this kind of stuff. Yeah, are you, are you running into any issues with like trying to scale it up? Is that the problem? Or are you just looking for best practices? Uh, yeah, I'm just moving from a, multi, a single cluster deployment to a multi-cluster, multiple tenant, and you then let people do their own rules and like alert broadcasting into their own pager duties, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the, the stateful sets and trying to look at what we are doing about rule HA is gonna help you a lot. I think also making sure that your root tenant knows that the impact that the rules causes on the ingestion part or the query part, uh, it's a heavy load because it's always running constantly. Uh, that was the biggest thing that we already saw on rulers for Cortex. Yeah. Um, did, that, did that answer your question? 
cool. Uh, I think we have time for, I think, one more question. If anyone has any questions on Cortex. Well, we have five minutes, actually, <laughs> so we have a lot of time for questions. I can, I can talk a bit more about um, the multi-tenancy bit, if anyone's interested. I think, OK, I'm, I'm seeing some nods. Yes, that's good. <laughs> good. Uh, OK, so let me pull back to some of the slides that I had for the ingestion piece. and. Um, Talk a bit more about multi-tenancy. OK. Uh, yeah, let's go back to the beginning. So this is Prometheus. It's uh, historically not multi-tenant. And what can you do if you want to add multi-tenancy? Right? You have the, the main kind of benefit of Cortex is that you get this multi-tenancy out of the box. It's built for multi-tenancy. It came from the beginning with multi-tenancy. And the way that it does this is by using um, this header. It's called, uh, it's, a, it's basically an HTTP header. And you set it when you're making these uh, requests to Cortex. And you say, hey, I am this person or this tenant when you send that request. And that's how Cortex, when it sees that request and is um, you know, processing it, it will look at that header to figure out, OK, you are this tenant. I'm going to serve you for these you know, sets of rules that are in place for this tenant. Um, and if you're a different tenant, then I'll use these sets of rules. Um, and so the nice thing about Cortex is that um, uh, depending on which tenant you are, you can, you can set different limits. So let's say you have a tenant that's huge, right? You can say, use this limit for this tenant. Like, you are allowed to store this amount of metrics. You are allowed to query. Uh, for this amount of time, you're allowed to query um, at, this, at this rate. Um, and all of these limits, and, and there's many limits to, to configure for each tenant, but you can set it per tenant. And you don't even need to restart your cluster to apply them. They're just values that could be hot reloaded on the cluster in real time. So um, it makes it really cool and easy to manage for um, the various tenants that you're managing. Um, and you can have uh, as many tenants as you want. And um, you don't need to reconfigure your cluster to handle more tenants, really. It's just, you just base. Actually, so the way that uh, Cortex works is if you want to create a new tenant, you don't need to even reconfigure Cortex. You could just start sending requests to Cortex with a new header value for that tenant, and then it'll just make a new tenant for you, which is really nice. So let's say you have tenant A, and use that in the header, and then it'll create a tenant for you. And then if you want to have tenant B, you just set the value for that header to be tenant B, and then Cortex will create it for you on the fly. So that's really cool. The only time you, you really need to configure anything is if you want to set limits that are specific to that tenant. Uh, otherwise, it just manages everything else for you by default. Um, and that's really the, the awesome Impressive. benefit here of having um, Cortex as your multi-tenant solution. I think, yeah. Sorry. I think one difference also is because Cortex used this ring that Charlie mentioned before uh, with the tokens. And it's something that others want, doesn't use it. And that allows you to control a lot how the sharding works between distributed and gestures. So you can have a number of limit of pods for each one, a tenant, another limit of pods for another tenant. If you have a bigger uh, tenant, you can give more ingestions for that tenant. So that gives you a lot of flexibility of controlling each tenant differently, and also for the limits that Charlie mentioned. I think, uh, yeah. yeah, I think we're out of time. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming thank to you. our talk, and uh, thank you.